So welcome um, for our penultimate lecture. I think next week you're stuck with just Stacy and myself, <laughs> but we promise to make it fun. Um, but this week we have Sharon Terry, who is a personal inspiration for me, uh, both for the work she does today, but also, as I've shared with her often, the story of her life and the choices she's made um, and how she's taken on problems that she never thought she was going to take on has been really inspiring. And I think you'll hear a little bit about um, that path through her talk. Um, but Sharon uh, today is a, um, I would say, a global, globally recognized and a global patient advocate, especially when it comes to issues around rare diseases, but not only. Um, and her path into this area came from a personal, um, a personal lens that she brought to um, the work we do to understand rare diseases and then to also help patients with rare diseases. And you can understand by the fact that I'm saying rare disease that one of the major challenges, there are many, is that there are often not enough patients to really power studies. Um, there are often uh, physicians who are seeing patients take a long time to recognize the symptoms because it's just one out of you know however many hundreds and thousands. Um, and so there are particular challenges that patients have when they're faced with a disease that just doesn't happen very frequently. Um, and that's one of them. The second is you've heard this theme throughout that the, unfortunately, even though medicine um, and health is about the person, often we forget the person in applying our science and our tools. And so uh, you add the fact that a disease might be rare to the fact that we often forget the patient voice and you've got uh, trouble often for a parent who might have kids that has rare, have rare disease or even as an adult if you get it. So Sharon's really um, traveled this path herself. Um, she, in my opinion, is a citizen scientist before citizen science became like the next cool thing. She is the original citizen sci scientist as you'll hear through her story. Um, and if we are not at the table, we are on the menu, that title immediately tells you a little bit about the kind of person that Sharon is. And I think I'm going to actually let her explain the title, although I did clarify that my understanding of the title was the same as her understanding of the title. So without further ado, Sharon, over to you. And then we'll, at the end, we'll take questions. I'll ask you some. And I know folks here will have something as well. Great. Great. Thanks very much. Really uh, terrific to be with you all today. So uh, if we're not at the table, we're on the menu means we better be part of the process as people or we'll be eaten, essentially. And I'll, I'll certainly uh, uh, go into that a little bit more. So why am I here? And, and Minnie actually really um, teed that up very well, because this is very personal for me. And why are you here? because it's personal for you as well. And I'm hopefully today going to bring that home to you in a very personal way. So this is not about those people that we sometimes say patients, those people, they're not us, they're over there. Of course, some of us are patients as well. I would contend that the word patient even is not a good word. I like to say I'm not patient, I'm impatient, first of all. And the second thing is the asymmetry of power in being a patient. In fact, somebody just posted on my Facebook page today, look at these like parchment things they make you sit on in the exam room that make all kinds of noise. And I basically said, what if we ask our doctor to sit on it with a naked butt and see how that feels? Because then we would have more symmetry in our relationship if we were really partners. This is about you and me, it's about us, and it's about really building a big we. You're at the very beginning of a lot, a lot of learning, a lot of deciding how you're gonna enter various systems, whether it's the medical clinical system or whether it's something else that you decide by the time you get there. But I think in all cases, we now have to be part of we's, part of networks. And the big thing for me is this, this phrase, let's show up before we have to leave. And that can mean simply today's class, because that's what we have. We have this time together, this moment, this presence right now. Or it could mean life. Like, let's show up in life before we leave this planet. So first, we're going to listen to, hear, and be present to ourselves, to yourself. And I'm going to have you do an exercise that might be uncomfortable or might be very comfortable. Um, the first one we're going to do, and I need my uh, trusty uh, timer is we're going to spend five minutes, which is a really, really long time sometimes. As you well know, if you decide to do a plank for five minutes or burpees for five minutes or study something you don't want to study for five minutes, it's really long. If you're eating ice cream or talking to a good friend or something else, it might be really short. So this may be long or short for you. 
What I'm going to ask everyone to do is simply breathe. And during that breathing, and some of you know this sort of thing from meditation or mindfulness practice, but it, during this breathing, I'm going to ask you to tune into yourself and listen to yourself like we don't most of, the most of the time. So if you have a laptop, I'm going to ask you to close your laptop. If you have a cell phone, an iPhone, smartphone, I'm going to ask you to turn it off or silence it or whatever and stick it in your pocket or under your leg or in your bag or somewhere you can't see it because it will be very, very tempting. And then some people like to close their eyes because it's easier to screen out the external stimuli, but that's okay if you want to keep them open as well because during this listening to yourself, what I invite you to do is not so much to listen to your thoughts, but also not to go, no thoughts, no thoughts, no thoughts, because that turns into a big thought, right? But instead to listen to your body, how's it feel? What's it feeling like on the seat with your feet on the floor or not? Listen to your skin, how's the temperature of the room? Are there breezes or not? Listen to your feelings, which are in your body, and find those feelings in your body. I'm feeling annoyed, this is really boring. Where's that feeling in your body? I'm feeling great. This is really relaxing. Where's that feeling in your body? So we're going to do that for five minutes to be present to ourselves to start with because it will be critical uh, for the kind of stuff that we're going to look at together. So my timer will ding a mindfulness bell at the beginning and then it will ding it at the end. And if your eyes have been closed, uh, open them and start to be aware of the room again. Invitation to deeply, deeply listen to ourselves is one that takes some practice just like anything else. If I had asked everybody to do five minutes of burpees, you would have, some of you, a hard time. If you didn't have a hard time, probably you practice burpees. And so this invitation to listen to ourselves is something we need to practice whatever way we choose to practice. Um, but an exercise like this, I find, brings me to awarenesses that I am otherwise rushing over and really improves my ability to listen to myself and to everyone else. We're gonna do a second practice, and this time you're gonna need a partner. So if everyone could find a partner right now, and I'll wait till everybody has, you're gonna to need to sit close to them because this is gonna be a noisy room. And if you don't have a partner, raise your hand so that somebody else who doesn't have a partner can find somebody. We need somebody to pair with Someone in the balcony, or you'll have to come down. Who doesn't have a partner? Raise your hand. Okay, so maybe you guys right here could get together, and then if you don't mind coming down from the balcony, there's somebody in the end row here. Great. So everybody has somebody else? Okay, in this next exercise, we're going to be present to each other. So, yeah, over here. Um, we're going to be present to each other, and we're going to deeply listen. And this is going to be seem a little awkward because most of the time when we're listening to someone else, aren't we doing a lot of judging, a lot of storytelling in our own mind, connecting uh, the dot, you know, Minnie might be telling me, oh, her daughter said da da da, and I'm thinking, what other five-year-olds do I know and how will she be as a five-year-old and I'm not really listening to what it is to understand or hear about her five-year-old. We're going to do an inquiry with the other person and this inquiry is going to be, tell me what you need. Now, that's a pretty open-ended question. It's also an invitation, because I'm going to say, tell me what you need. So one person is going to be the questioner, and the other person is going to be a monologuer for five minutes, and then you're going to switch. During the monologue, you are not going to bring your judgment to this. So for example, if Minnie said to me, tell me what you need, I'm going to start, I recommend, by kind of going to that same place we just were in. Like, I'm going to say, OK, I really want to answer that question, so I really want to kind of find my center or kind of find what I hear. And I might say, I need a drink of water. I need my jacket to be warmer. But I might say, I need to be relevant to the people I'm with today. I need to be heard. I need to be loved and so on. And I'm going to continue for five minutes to tell her what I need. And if I'm quiet, she might invite me again. She might say, thank you. Tell me what you need. She might say nothing. I also might say nothing, because nothing is arising, or it isn't helpful for me to say anything. The 
Interesting thing about this is when you're the monologuer, you are not performing for the other person. You are listening to yourself, and if it's helpful, you're speaking some of that out loud. You're not taking care of the other person. They'll take care of themselves. Listeners, I want you to listen, but only listen like 80%. Reserve about 20% for your own listening. Wow, I'm aware that when she said she needs to be relevant for this room, so do I. I'm aware when she said she's thirsty, so am I. I'm not, whatever. So does that make sense? You're gonna have one person will ask this question, tell me what you need, and the other person for five minutes, which again is pretty long, right? For five minutes will say what you need. And you can go anywhere in this, from the practical to something really profound for you. You're gonna do this in whatever way suits you, and the other person is gonna really, really listen to you, also listening to themselves. Okay, is that clear? Does, does anyone need more clarification on that? Um, is this funny and weird? Yep, so that's fine. The other thing I'm gonna ask you to do is, as a listener, don't go, Wow, oh, because what are you doing? You're actually taking away from the other person's experience, right? You're taking a bandwidth. Give them the space. Obviously, you can smile. We actually, have, we actually do this exercise sometimes with no facial expression at all. You can smile, you can nod, but don't, don't give them any feedback, so to speak, because we really wanna give them space to see what arises in them without the judgment from you. Does that make sense? Okay. Okay, we're gonna switch. And I think uh, you lost your partner, right? Do you have a partner? Okay, there's, a, there's somebody in the balcony there for you. You guys, you guys can pair up. Yeah, or up, yeah. So we're gonna switch now, and the person who was speaking, monologuing, is going to ask the question, tell me what you need, and the other person is going to respond with a, with a monologue, okay? And then we'll debrief together as a room after this uh, so that everybody can have the experience. Okay, so <laughs> feedback or reflection on the experience. Anybody wanna offer some out loud to everybody? I love that you, were allow you allowed us to only listen 80%. <laughs> Good. Hmm, great. And actually, I think connect better. Hmm, yeah, super. Other, other feelings, experiences, impressions. Come on, guys, give me something. I'm putting myself up here like this. Terrific. Good. I have kind of like a rebuttal to that, I guess, in yeah. that, like, I mean, I'm a college student and I'm constantly overwhelmed with all the things that I need constantly. And so being able to just listen and be like, I know off the top of my head, I am very ready to listen to what I need. <laughs> I need real, I need lots of stuff. And yeah, I was just going through my normal list that I'm like stuck with in my head every day. Like, Cool. Good. So my, my impression of the room was that we had ebb and flow, we had some discomfort and a lot of comfort. Um, the other thing that's really striking to me is so no matter what we do, lots of you might be physicians, nurses, clinicians of some kind, you might work in something completely different. Listening to each other is really important and how hard it is sometimes for us to like look each other in the eye and really give our attention to someone, and as you said, to also be able to reserve something for ourselves so that we do have the space to also be ourselves in that encounter. And how impressive it is, and I don't mean that to impress, I mean impressed upon the person receiving that, is the opportunity to be really listened to, because lots of us are not listened to a lot of the time. So this 
was simply for us to give ourselves some context around if we're going to talk about people, patients, uh, participants in research, how deeply we need to listen to them and to the communities that we're going to work into the families in order that we do really know what the people need before we make up a decision or an idea and just lay it on them, which has happened to all of us all our lives. So this opportunity to, again, stop and practice it like a gym, this really specific thing, we've exaggerated it, right? We don't usually behave in this way. Um, this gave us an opportunity to exaggerate it. So I'm going to go into my talk, um, which I hope won't take very long, because I really do want this to be a discussion, uh, and, and to give us an opportunity to look at this issue after you've looked at so many issues throughout the course of this semester. You are the only expert on you. So regardless of whatever happened in that encounter, whether it was that you said very little, that you said a lot, that you said just stuff that you need on a kind of uh, concrete basis, whether you said some things about your feelings, you're the expert on you. And what you need to do, you know. And I want to propose that really people, patients, and again, I don't really like that word, but we'll use it because there's a lot of healthcare context stuff going on, are the only experts in themselves. So as much as we try to help in some way, um, we're really going to need to look at people as the experts for themselves. My two children were diagnosed in 1994 with a rare condition. It's called pseudoxanthoma elasticum. PXE means never having to say pseudoxanthoma elasticum. Um, they were diagnosed, and we were shocked, shocked. We thought we had two normal kids. And actually, we do have two normal kids. They happen to have mutations in the ABCC6 membrane transport protein gene. Our view of this was there was an onset of symptoms, in their case, some dots on the side of my daughter's neck. Didn't know my son had this until the physician looked at her. Uh, and I wanted to know what's the health outcome from this. What I learned from the physician the day we finally got a diagnosis after a couple years was, oh, she'll probably be blind when she's 30 or so. Oh, she'll uh, probably have cardiovascular disease. She may have uh, some other pieces of this condition. I basically wanted us to get really fast to that health outcome. And instead, there's all this stuff along the line. And every person who works in any or, or all of those areas believes that they're doing the most important thing. But what we wind up with is a really disjunctured system. There isn't a system, really. And if people are working on animal studies, for example, they think that's the most important thing. And they forget that those need to be relevant in some way to people. So does gene discovery. So does natural history of a disease, et cetera. And so when my husband and I were faced with two little kids, they were six and four, they had a, all of a sudden, two days before Christmas, they have a disease, we're pretty shocked. And we figure, oh, but you just go to the doctor. He writes a prescription, or she writes a prescription, and you go to the drugstore. And we learned that that is not the case for the 7,000 rare conditions. And I will contend that's not the case for a lot of common conditions. You all know people who have arthritis, cancer, diabetes, heart disease, obesity, and they don't know what to do, and they go from drug to drug to drug. You know people with mental health conditions, depression, bipolar disorder, they get drug after drug after drug, and it doesn't work. So, my husband and I realized that this kind of look at the world is one that we people, people, all of us, can bring to the world. I was invited right away to carry the briefcases of scientists into rooms. Like, you can carry my briefcase, and you can sit in the back, and we will do the work. And my husband and I decided that just was going to be too slow, and we would be 20 years later with nothing. So we established a foundation. We created the first lay-led blood and tissue bank. We taught ourselves how to clone a gene. I have a master's in religious studies. My husband never went to college. He was a fire protection engineer at the time. We borrowed lab space at Harvard. We got postdocs who were very generous to teach us. We created diagnostic tests. We put together a consortium of researchers, and we created clinical trials. We now, in this year, have four clinical trials going on. My kids are 29 and 27. My son last week thought he was having the beginning of vision loss, so it was a pretty dramatic week for us. We still don't have an answer. We're closer to an answer. Um, but we had to do all this stuff ourselves. We're not heroes for doing it. We did what we thought was pretty practical. And since we did this, lots of other groups have done it as well. I joined about 13 years ago with an organization called Genetic Alliance, which is 10,000 health organizations. 2,000 of these or so are, are disease advocacy organi organizations like mine that got established at a, at a kitchen table. And we're really talking a lot about people-centered design. 
the kind of experiment you're doing here to say, this should be designed. We shouldn't just say, oh, we're going to build something and not have a design for it. That's crazy. Car manufacturers do not just say, let's slap together a car. They actually do ask, how many cup holders shall we have, and what colors do people like? And we don't do that in health. So we're trying to do that more in health. As I said, there's other organizations doing this. This is one, the Progeria Research Foundation. These kids die at a, between 13 and 16 years old from premature aging. The foundation itself has 54 projects, $6 million, 51 researchers in 10 countries, and so on and so on. Another one, parent project muscular dystrophy, boys who die of muscular dystrophy sometime in their late teens or early 20s, has 20 drugs in the pipeline. So these are just people, ordinary folks without medical backgrounds, working now to accelerate the change we want to see, uh, doing what is now called citizen science. There was no name for it when we started to do it, but really putting ourselves out there to try to become part of the system more than just carrying a briefcase and certainly not being on the menu, but not only even just being invited to the table. I used to be excited to be invited to the table, and now I'm saying, no, I want to plan the meal. I want to decide who else is going to come. I want to decide uh, where we're going to have this meal so that we're really all working together. I like this picture because I think what the healthcare system often thinks is that here we are in the center and everything revolves around us. And we know that that model went out you know, uh, thousands of years ago and there essentially is a, a more heliocentric model that is true. And if the person is at the center, we make really different decisions. If we asked every single time what's best for the person, would we say you have to go to the doctor between 9 a.m. and 5 p.m.? Would we say you have to pay 13 different ways for five services? Would we say this hospital on one side of town is not going to talk to this hospital on the other side of town? We wouldn't say any of that. We'd say none of that makes sense, and let's get to what makes sense. So what this has to do with people is there's two secrets. One is we don't have the answers to basic problems in health. We don't like to say that. Your doctor doesn't usually say, I don't know. It would be great if he or she did, and I hope that when you get to wherever you're going to go, you say, I don't know, and that we the people are the experts. We're the answer to the question. What else do we know? We know, and this is a tweet from Harlan Krumholtz, who's really fun to follow if you, if you want to follow a really interesting clinician researcher, that essentially when um, we have communication between patients and their um, clinicians, their health systems, there's better health outcomes. Well, isn't that remarkable? We basically just practice what does it mean to talk to each other and do we know something about each other then that makes it easier for us to work with each other. The New England Journal of Medicine on data sharing essentially said it's important to honor and reward altruism, but one way to do this is to share the data we gather in clinical trials, which we don't right now, because another report said we aren't even publishing um, these trials, and in fact, um, only 36% reported or published results within the last 24 months of all the trials done in the United States, hundreds and hundreds of trials. Lots of those failed, by the way, but let's say they failed so someone else doesn't do them over. This book just came out by Richard Harris of NPR, um, Rigor Mortis, and essentially this book says that if we, for example, take 53 landmark studies in cancer, only six could be reproduced. And they worked with the original researchers to reproduce their results and can't. There is a lot of irreproducible science that's happened, partly because we're rushing to get the science finished, to get the next grant proposal in, to get the money, to get to the next step. Lots of dis misaligned incentives in the system. So engaging people means that we, people, are partners and co-creators and co-investigators in the process about our own health in health services or about our own health in research. We're not only at the table, we're actually planning the meal. I think the other thing we need to look at is what about frictionless engagement? How do we put healthcare services in our path so they're not hard to get to? How many people don't do an annual physical because it's really hard to schedule it? I can't schedule it online. I can't go at night after classes or after work. It's very inconvenient for me to do it. We need, it needs to be where we live and where we play. We also need to be really relevant. Are you answering the questions I care about? So many times I think we find that our clinicians, our health systems are not answering the question we care about. My most favorite example of this is studies with those boys in muscular dystrophy. So those boys wind up in wheelchairs. You've seen you know, telethons and stuff where those kids are. Um, basically, what they do in those studies is they measure something called a six minute walk test. How far can you walk in six minutes? The boys can't walk, they're in wheelchairs, and so the drugs are not approved. Some of the boys on those drugs, though, continue to be able to type. 
And what the boys have told the researchers, my being able to type and do Facebook and Twitter and emails with my friends is so much more important than my walking for six minutes that I want to give up walking in order to continue to communicate. Makes sense to me, but isn't what the researchers are asking for. We really need to watch our language as well, and if you do some uh, radar for this and, and that kind of 80-20 listening, I find lots of times we have conversations like, let's let people be part of this. We can let them come in. We can let the patient have a say. And essentially, we're not in any position to let anybody do anything because people already have the right to do this. It's the same thing that we see with minority communities, underserved communities. We are not empowered to let someone else do something. It's also not about educating, because lots of times I hear this whole thing would be fine if we would just educate people. We need to give them flyers at bus stops. We need to give them brochures. We need to give them pamphlets. That's ridiculous. When we look at things like, who educated you to use Facebook? Did you take a class in Facebook? Nobody has to take it. Even I know an 88-year-old person who just got on Facebook. He has 30 friends. He's doing fine on Facebook. We can find esoteric items in Amazon. We know when the next Netflix binge watching can, can happen. And the increased use of apps. Uh, whatever app we use, those apps are now in the millions, sometimes billions of use. The reason is not because someone paid you to use any of these apps or to look at Netflix to see what's going to come out in a series that you want to watch. It's because you want to do these things. You want to participate. And we need to figure out ways to participate in our own health in the same way. This is from a, um, a, a network called Improve Care Now. And essentially, they're looking at the clinic visit as the hub of health care, except that most health care does not happen in the clinic. 90% of it happens outside the clinic. And are we tooling a system in the United States and elsewhere for care outside the clinic? And I think the answer is no, not yet. We still are very institutionally focused. And in their uh, experiment, essentially what they've done is done routine capture of outcomes for people. They've informed pre-visit planning so that the family comes in, in this case pediatrics, ready to meet with the clinician and to say the things they need, customizing it so personal learning is happening for that person, and then aggregating information from individuals. And their goal basically is to say, most healthcare will happen outside the healthcare system. How can we remove the clinician, remove the nurse, remove the doctor as much as possible so the community is learning? I'm part of something called PCORnet, which is an experiment nationwide to do this kind of thing, essentially to say, what if we put people at the center? And the kind of inertia in the system is incredible. Every time we try to make a decision in favor of people that are very obvious decisions, the big institutions, the small institutions, the community hospitals all have some pushback. We can't do it because of that. We can't do it because of this. And I think it's going to be up to us, and especially you, because I think you're going to have much less of the the pull away from people that, that we've all had to deal with to be able to enable people to make their own decisions about health. And so we've been looking at how do we engage all the stakeholders together, including things like we have a group that hates the word stakeholders. So how do we respect that they hate that because it sounds like stockholders? And how do we create infrastructure and tools that allow us to share quickly and easily? And I have a whole bunch of those that I'm not going to talk about today, but essentially taking data from electronic health records, from trackers, from my own experience of my disease or my health, and collecting that information such that you've seen the stories on, for example, Target sending pregnancy uh, advertising to a young woman's house. And her parents are shocked that she's pregnant. And why is this stuff coming to her house when Target figured out that she was pregnant? So we have ways of figuring out, and I would say with permission of the individuals, how to use this information. In this case, we have 20 of these patient-powered research networks, like mine and the other ones I showed you, clinical data research networks like UCSF. That's how I met Minnie, as she was a co-investigator with me in this project. Um, and then all these together put this national structure together. Whether this is going to be the answer, I don't know. I'm putting a lot of my bets on this because I really want to push it. But I think we're going to need experiments like are happening here about redesigning from the ground up and not succumbing to the, to the uh, challenges that are around us. So I think ultimately this is a culture challenge. And if you do nothing else, be present. And we practiced a little bit of presence at the very beginning here. Be curious. Being curious will really give you a lot, a lot of um, pathway into things that will make a big difference. Be non-maternal or paternalistic. Um, 
engage in shared decision making. So when you get to places where you're making decisions, make sure you're listening to see if these are what somebody really needs. Tell me what you need. It may not be what you think the other person needs, and they're the expert. Tell the truth. I do not know. I do want to know. I care. I would love it if physicians and, and clinicians would say that more often. Be trustworthy. I think often we say, why doesn't the community trust us? Why don't those people trust us? And what I've learned over these years of working on this is I need to look at how am I trustworthy or not trustworthy to actually put the burden on the sick family, the sick community, the sick um, uh, geographic area or, or ethnic group and say, you have to trust me, puts another burden on them in, in addition to their already um, overladen life with, with whatever kinds of um, disabilities or, or disease they have. Face your or our fears. This will be weird at first, but it's your greatest tool. So our experiment earlier on, you guys face some fears of doing something kind of weird in a classroom that you don't typically do. It's really curious and interesting to ask, what did that evoke in me? Why was it uncomfortable? Why was it comfortable? Why did I not want to look at the other person? Why didn't I want to ask, answer this question? Um, what, was, what was my fear of the question? Uh, in, invitation to enter fear. And you can bet that when my kids were diagnosed, I had to go straight into monstrous fear. That was really hard. I want to push those feelings away. It's taken me 22 years to say, I want to be curious about why I'm so afraid of things that actually they're not afraid of, and why am I not listening to them? There was one point when our kids said to us, when you stop fighting disease and start living with it the way we do, then you will succeed. They were 11 and 13 years old at the time. And then transparency. We're going to make mistakes, all of us. But if we just look at those mistakes, apologize for them, and move forward, uh, there will be a lot more trust in the system. This is my son and his wife. He got married in 2014. This is my daughter and her wife. She got married in 2015. They will both tell you that they're happy, healthy kids. Uh, my daughter just got accepted to grad school, as did her wife. My son uh, and his wife just moved to Atlanta because they're starting up a company. Um, they both do face all the ramifications of having this disease, and we don't know what that future holds. But they both also believe that if they face their own fears, and if they listen to the people around them, then they will make a difference as well. There's my contact information. And I could leave us with some questions for right now, in this moment. And it doesn't have to pertain to what I just said, but about what are you curious? What scares you? What excites you? What worries you? And what do you need? Thank you. Right. Do you want to sit up there? Sometimes we sit down sure, here. This is, it, might yeah, be, that's great. it might be better, and we can um, start with some questions. So I'll ask you a few while folks get gather your thoughts on what scares you. You can ask Sharon, right? I mean, she's invited. She's asked you questions, so you can ask those back. back yeah, you back definitely can ask me questions. But, but just um, riffing off of that, so you've, you know, as I said, became a citizen scientist before that was even a phrase. What was the scariest moment, or what were some of the scariest mm. moments that you had to get through in mm. order to go on this path and basically you know, discover genes yeah. and, and do things that other folks with PhDs were doing, and yet you were more successful? Yeah, great question. So one of the scariest moments was the moment of diagnosis. So mm. I was overwhelmed because they said pseudoxanthoma, and I had no no medical background, and when you hear oma, you think lymphoma, you know, melanoma. And my brother and father had both just died of cancer, so I was freaked. So that was terrifying. But I immediately took up a crusader flag for my kids uh, that I've actually had to let go and put down in a lot of ways. Uh, but the next frightening thing for me was that there was no answer, and nobody, I thought, you know, you take a deli ticket and you get somebody to go to pee and do PXE, and that didn't happen. And then the next thing was saying, how am I going to walk in a room filled with researchers like this and ask them for what I need? Um, and to either meet with them one on one, they'll think I don't know what I'm talking about. I, as my husband's fond of saying, we didn't know a gene from a hubcap. Recessive disease. I mean, there was all kinds of stuff we had to go through. So I think my fears were around: will, Am I adequate? Am I enough? And then they became very, very deep about: Will I make a difference? Will I make a difference? And I really have sat with that question a lot. And only in the last few years, and again, this is 22 years long, I've uh, realized that I am enough as I am. Am I going to solve all the problems? I don't know. 
am I going to even prevent my kids from being blind? I don't know. And that I just have to do what I can do and not worry, am I enough the whole time? Hmm. Yes, we have a question. Excellent. I was just going to say, do you think your theology background helps you um, with, I guess, like this whole process? Because like, I feel like you like, practice a lot of mindfulness and like, it might come into play. Yeah, so that's a great question. So did my theology background help? So first I rejected God as soon as this happened. Um, I basically went to that, you know, how could bad things happen to good people kind of place. And I was a Roman Catholic nun before I got married. So I rejected kind of all the traditional stuff and the Catholic Church and everything else. And my kids actually, when they were 9 and 11, asked if we could go to a Buddhist retreat. I don't know why they asked that. And it was a week-long silent retreat. And we went every year after that. My uh, son brings his wife to it now. We don't go together anymore because of time. Um, but, but I think, um, yes, because one of the things I was trained in was really listening, because I was a pastoral counsel, counselor, a, a college chaplain. And so I was able to really connect with people uh, and we could build this community. And then when I did move into the more mindfulness stuff, really to be more free to do things like say, I don't know, I'm afraid, I don't know if I'm enough, and to be more frank about those things because the lovely thing about most, most Buddhism, which is just lifestyle, not religion, is essentially to say, this is all I got, I'm here, and right now is the only moment I have too, so i do not gonna rehearse for the future because I can't control it. Um, and that did, yeah, absolutely help. And I've been absorbing that more and more um, over the last few years because I think that really helps us connect better as people as well. What have you seen sort of moving to the, the present and, and on the healthcare and, and science side, what have you seen recently that has given you exceptional hope? So a, a shift in the, the way healthcare is provided or the way research is tied to it or institutional changes? Yeah, so, so there's some big ones that don't feel big when we're in the day to day. But uh, for example, when I first started, uh, the kids' blood was taken two days after Christmas by a group at Harvard. And then two days after that, a group came from Mount Sinai in New York City and said, we want blood. And I said, oh, go ask the other guys for blood. These are little kids, and they're not going to give blood again. And they said, we don't share. That's ridiculous. They probably would still sort of say that. But now, what I find before, they would just say right, outright, to a mother of two little kids, we don't share. That's ridiculous. Now they would say, we should share. So at least there's been a shift. Now, whether they're sharing or not is a whole other question. But I just came, in fact, last week from New England Journal of Medicine data sharing um, meeting. And you don't have to convince anybody anymore that it's a good idea to share. You, you used to have to like, be hawking vinyl siding or cars to people you know, and saying, you should believe it's a good idea to share. And now I find people hmm. are sharing more freely. Um, I also think that there is a sea change about the involvement of people. So there's a thing called PDUFA 6, which is the Authorization Act for FDA. It gets reauthorized every uh, five years. It's on the sixth reauthorization. And in it now, it says, don't bring us a drug, you big drug company, unless you have real world evidence. So back to those boys who want to type, that has to be part of it and unless you have p patient engagement, people engagement. That's baked in now. They have to have mm -hmm. it. Now, there's no doubt they're going to you know, check some boxes that they make up and they do some voodoo around, but at least it's in there. And the same thing with CTSAs, which are the clinical trial um, research um, Clinical and Translational Science, Science Institute. Awards. Yeah. Yes, yeah, awards. Oh, that's his name. Um, anyway, there's 61 of them in the United States, and the new authorization of them says you have to engage people. And then PCORnet, you have to engage people. So I think we're starting to, at least here, we have to mm -hmm. engage people. They still say, by the way, there's 10 cents for engaging people and $3 million for doing the data and the research. So we still have a ways to go there, too. But it makes me happy that we are finally at least, at least starting to say it. We still do have a long way to go, because I remember on the, on the uh, PCORnet proposal that we were working on, in early days, and so this was at, when I was at UCSF, which is a fantastic place, and I usually think the faculty are very enlightened and the researchers there are well-leading, but would understand things like why it's important to bring the patient perspective in. But I remember that some of the earliest faculty, so we were trying to turn the tables, and we were saying, well, what happens if a, um, a research question is first framed by the patient? 
rather than by the researcher and then so sort of turn the tables and sort of really have a collaboration on which research questions are the most relevant. So this is key because of the typing example that Sharon gave. Another one was, I recall, um, so for many of the rare diseases, it's parents looking after their children who've gotten the rare diseases. And so the questions that the researchers were asking were fine, but then parents wanted to say, well, actually, if you asked us, we've come together. And the most important question to us is, how can we make sure the child sleeps? which would not have been the first question the researcher was asking, but through the lived experience of the children, that was clearly the most important. But anyway, when we were uh, in early days bringing that, we had faculty at UCSF who reacted really badly mm -hmm. and, and displayed kind of a level of arrogance that was quite stunning yeah. to me um, and basically dismissed yes. the validity of that. Yeah. So it still felt like we had a ways yeah. to go. Yeah, and they still say, I mean, at this meeting last week in, in uh, Boston, people still said, how would a person know what research question is important? You know, like, well, of course we would know what research question is important. But no, they, we, they, they don't have the education to know what research question is important. And I have a dual response to that, because some part of me goes, well, that's right. <laughs> Because there's a science part there's of science it. science and But the only, the only thing that I'll give myself is that I at least know when I'm wrong <laughs> <laughs> on that. And so that's been a path. Yeah. But, um, any other questions from y'all? On the first exercise, on Sharon's experience. What are you curious about? Tell us a little bit about your um, experience on uh, the uh, President Obama's Precision Medicine Initiative. That's yeah. really interesting. And yeah. you were at the White House, and I don't know if you met them. Or yes, yes, yes. Yeah, I did. Yeah, which was just incredible. Um, yeah, so that was another place there's a lot of hope because it was whatever, 2014, in like January or February, uh, President Obama invited about 100 people to the uh, east wing of the White House, and uh, we all sat in this room where he said, People should not just be participating, they should be partners in science, in biomedical research, which was like out of the president's mouth that came. That was quite incredible. And that was him announcing the Precision Medicine Initiative that he set up, and that actually got funded and got started and is actually still going. We're, we're you know, like everything in Washington these days is like, be really quiet and maybe nobody will notice that we're still doing this, whatever this is. And in this case, we're still doing a precision medicine initiative. So I served on a bunch of the committees that led up to the creation of this thing and then now serve on the advisory panel. And essentially, the precision medicine initiative says we're going to capture a million people in the United States in health centers, but also in just regular old volunteers. And those people will give us a certain number of samples that are pretty simple to get, like fingernail clippings, blood, saliva. Um, bless you. And then uh, we'll, we'll follow them over time, kind of like you may have heard of the Framingham Heart Study, where they follow people for years and years and years. So they're in looking to enroll young people, old people, people of all ethnic groups and racial groups. Um, and follow them over a long period and look at, th these will be healthy or not so healthy people and how does disease progress or not? What about geography? What about socioeconomic status? So a really, really big project. And it continues to be funded to about $140 million a year. Um, and I have great hope for it as well. Uh, again, with a potential 20% cut in the, in the NIH budget, that's going to be pretty tough. Um, I'm not sure how much you guys are aware that on Saturday morning the government partially shuts down because the Congress hasn't passed the budget, so NIH is not writing their grants checks these days. Uh, so the various scientists are trying to live off last month's checks. The PMI, the Precision Medicine Initiative, is in the same boat, so we're hoping that the Congress pulls a rabbit out of a hat. And just on my way here, I heard that the um, president decided that uh, he doesn't have to get the wall paid for right now, and he can wait till September. So maybe we'll get the budget passed. Um, but anyway, that's yeah, that's that was really exciting. And then I think, I mean, it was super exciting for an ordinary person like me uh, to go to the White House to shake the president's hand. And then more recently, just before his term ended, he did a big pioneers in science event at Carnegie Mellon in Pittsburgh and invited me to that as well. And they put me in the front row so that I could shake his hand. All really, really thrilling to you know have somebody who cared about science that much leading the nation was was amazing. So, 
I, I, think, uh, I think that gave me great hope. And then the corollary question is, and so how's Washington these days, and what about the level of hope? It's an interesting place because um, it's kind of like 9-11 every single day, like every day you wake up and another thing got cut or another hammer fell. And what I'm finding on the only sort of bright side of this, and I'm a pretty optimistic person, is that various groups of people now are figuring out creative ways of working together. So I think in austere times like this, we might get more quick, quicker sharing, more quicker collaborations, because people know we're just not going to survive unless we work together. So that may be, may be a bright spot in this whole thing. Um, questions from the group, or I have more. But oh, here we have one from Pat. Great. Yeah, great question. So I, in fact, personally don't believe we'll get to cure for most diseases and that we are going to be living with. Um, and that, in fact, our tagline on PXE International's website is let's tame the disease. Let's make it livable, essentially. And we know that with AIDS. We know it with a lot of cancers and stuff. So my sensibility around this, for, uh, for those of us who then work in some kind of leadership role or clini clinician role, is first to listen. Because I don't think it's, I think we've kind of made this artificial boundary, right, we, where we say, I'm the clinician and you're the person. I have you know, four minutes to see you and do an intake into a computer screen with my back to you. you know, just so many things. That, and I think if we begin to be able to connect, even if it's for a minute, then people, I mean, I listen to people over and over say, she looked me in the eye. And then she turned her back to put the stuff in the computer. But I felt connected. So I think that's first. And then the next thing is, lived experience can be elicited in the intakes that we do. Um, in addition to the standard questions, because there's nuances that inevitably people give us or give clinicians. And I listen to clinicians say, well, I just asked the simple question, do you wake at night? And she had to say, I wake at three, and I watch the show home shopping network, and I, you know, that flavor is OK. And yeah, we don't have time for it. And there is this part of us that say the system won't bear it. But I think those kinds of things help us to start to figure out and she needs some other kind of stimulus at this hour of the night. So what are we going to do about that? And or we need some kind of drug that doesn't have her wake up or whatever. Um, the other ways are more systematic ways. So I think when we start to build things like a clinic, what if we had people come in and say, here's what I think about how this clinic should work. Where, you know, what should I do while I'm in the waiting room? Why aren't you asking me, you know, various questions about this when I'm upset that you had me wait an hour? Why don't you at least say, oh my god, I get it. That's really awful. I would be really pissed to wait an hour. We don't do any of that. We just say, that's part of the system. And so there are a few experiments in that that I think are good for us to watch. And I think the kind of design stuff that you guys are doing here is also going to make a big difference. A ton of it is design. And when we think about other industries making stuff, whether it's you know iTunes, or it's cars, or it's Uber, you know those things were not um, made in a vacuum. They were made in response to need. The other thing I like to say is, and I say it about myself too, sometimes we're like taxi cab drivers sitting around trying to, re trying to invent Uber, which didn't happen. Taxi cab drivers, I mean, I tried to use Uber when I got in the Austin, um, and it kept saying, look at the message that says you can't use Uber. And I'm like, I can't use Uber? What? I, let me do this five times, because maybe there's something wrong with my app. Um, Clearly, taxi cab drivers don't want Uber to happen. I think the healthcare system, if it's a person, doesn't want this to happen. And so how do we have it happen? We have it happen because we demand stuff as people, 
but look how insulated we are from demanding. How do I tell my physician, I'd like to come at eight o'clock at night because I can't get out of work before five o'clock. I don't want to wait an hour. Or if I do, why don't you have me fill out family history stuff on a tablet that then you keep and don't have me fill it out the next time, you know, blah, blah, blah. So I think figuring out design and letting people have a say right away would make an enormous difference. Um, I had a question because you mentioned the thing about like the timing of like clinics and things like that from being nine to five and how that's inconvenient for the patient. Do you just expect doctors to like be there 24 seven? I'm just like, I just don't know. Or do you want them like maybe like not typical working hours? Like how would you solve that? I guess. So I think like other industries, you guys are way too young to remember that you could only go to the bank between nine and five, probably nine and four actually, and you could only go up to a person in the bank. There was no machine for the bank. So I think just like banking figured out some other things and shifts essentially and that sort of stuff, um, we could do the same thing in healthcare. So I could imagine, for example, a new mom who's a physician not wanting to work from nine to five because she'd like to be home when the kids get home from school. She'd like to bring them to school, drop them off. Dad gets home or other partner gets home. She would then maybe go into an office. I don't think we're gonna have, I mean, we do have healthcare at midnight in emergency rooms, but in normal routine visits, you know, till nine o'clock at night, let's say. I'm making this up. I also think there's lots of things we could be doing that we don't need a physician for. So there's, and these things are starting to come. You know, there's a lot of stuff we can do with our iPhones now. There's a project called Healthy Heart that every day, if you have a heart condition, you just put your fingers on the back of your iPhone because you have a sensor there that sends your information to the doctor. He tells you or she tells you, you need to come in because I'm seeing an aberration. Or uh, melanomas diagnosed now through an app or, you know, on and on. I think we could crowdsource things like pathology. You know, do we need a person to sit and look through a microscope and apparently make mistakes 64% of the time? Or do we put it on the internet like an experiment that happened in the UK recently and have ordinary folks, a librarian who's you know, 70 years old who comes home at night and scores uh, biopsies to say whether or not somebody has melanoma and has like a 95% rate of getting it right. So I think there's some creative ways we could do things. I also get that, you know, especially like if you guys are thinking I want to be a doctor or nurse, somebody in healthcare, I don't want to be going through all these years of education, owing enormous amounts of money, essentially putting yourself through incredible stress in the various periods like residency and, and all that stuff. It's not that bad. <laughs> and then, yeah, we're going to redesign all that before they get there. Um, and, then, and then you're expecting me to work at night? I think we need to think about that whole thing, the whole lead up. Like, is that a healthy lead up to a health profession? And then aren't there ways that we could make sure that there's enough workforce that everybody kind of gets what they need when they need it? And again, the people who want to work at night can work at night and the people who want to work during the day can work during the day. So do you think that the kinds of examples that Sharon gave, you know, the uh, different apps that are helping you now at home detect things, et cetera. Do you think that pace of change is, is a good pace of change in healthcare? Is it appropriate? Is it like other industries? Now that you're at the tail end of this course, just I mean, is it, how many people think that the pace of change in using these new apps and tools so that people don't have to go late at night, et cetera, is, it the, is, is sort of a good pace? Put up your hands. Couple, couple, so maybe, you, you, so it's like 40% of folks, 30, one third of folks. And how many people think that it's not a good pace? That it should be faster. That it should be faster. And then we'll go slower. Yeah. Okay, not nobody thinks it should be faster. And slower. how many, the rest of you don't have any opinions. So 60% of you have no opinions, 40%, 33% feel like, um, it's okay, and then 7% feel it could be faster. It's a disastrous rate. I mean, compared to any other industry, this stuff should have happened a long time ago. It's actually the apps themselves, the tools, the mechanisms are really not rocket science at all. So I want you to think about why that's, that's the case. I mean, we really are, a, we still use a fax. You've heard about this through our course if you haven't seen it in a doctor's office. Healthcare still uses the fax machine. I don't know where I was the other day, and 
Somebody was giving me an old sheet, and they just scratched out the facts. He's like, oh, yeah, this is silly. No one uses the facts. Oh, come to yes. my hospital. You'll see, yes. <laughs> you'll see the facts. Yep. So it's, it's a disastrous rate of, of um, innovation in the grand scheme of things. And you've learned some things through the course that should give you a sense of, well, why is that the case? Among, I mean, there are many reasons, but why are some central reasons why we're not moving fast enough? This is a hard question to ask when they actually think we're moving fast enough. So yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, although I'm really curious because I think it, if, you, if I told you right now that while we were sitting here, iTunes and Spotify and Pandora all shut down. You can't have music anymore unless you go to the record store and buy a CD. Would you be appalled? You'd be annoyed? And there are not many places they would be able to buy music from, except for you know the record store. And you'd have to right? go far, because there's Sixth no Street, more. On 6th yeah. um, Street, right. what's that famous record? Yeah. Waterloo or, Records? Or Facebook crashed, and they're not going to resurrect it, because it's too modern and too. So the interesting thing for me is, and you guys are predicting for yourselves that you'll be in a healthcare environment in, what is it, eight years or 10 years or whatever. What, so you have a different sensibility around your day-to-day -day stuff versus the medical stuff, right? And is it because you want to see a, a traditional trajectory for yourselves? Is that why? Is it, a is it a fear that you won't have a job, like there won't be a need for a lot of physicians if there's a lot of apps? What, what, what is the disconnect there, do you think, for you guys, if you think about that? Sharon, the disconnect between? Between you're pretty happy with lots of conveniences. You probably mm -hmm. would like Uber mm -hmm. in Austin, I'd imagine. Um, we do have ride-sharing apps, just not oh, Uber and Lyft. Okay. There was a political reason why Uber and Lyft are not in town Great. as yet. But there are others. There are like five uh, others. I, next time I'll do some research. That's a controversial topic. But, yes. but anyway, we do have ride-sharing anyway. apps in Austin. Yes. Good, good, good. good. Um, so, so is there a disconnect in you between you would like lots of your very, parts of your life's very easy to use, but when we get to health, and healthcare, you don't want to see this accelerated and made into apps and made, you know, different hours of the day and that sort of thing. Is that a disconnect that you feel? So, so I'll give my opinion. My opinion is I, I'm not worried about my music provider making a mistake, but I am worried about my healthcare provider making a mistake. And so I'll trust an app to give me maybe the wrong music. But if I, give, if I have that same app that tells me that, no, you don't have melanoma, when actually I do. So it's the sensitivity and the specificity of that app that concerns me more when I'm dealing with my health care than I am with maybe some other modern conveniences. And do we have a health care system that has few errors in it right now? Oh, no. So. But I can pretend. <laughs> I like it. So one of the things, I'll just consider that, that that's, a, that's a piece of it. But really, I mean, I would take you back to, in this case, Elizabeth Ticeberg's talk about where we are in the state of competition, for example. So do you think, in, in a hypothetical world, if we just, if we had our economy and we had our patients and our system of paying, and then we had this other hypothetical payer that came up, and they said, hey, any patients in America, if you're not getting what you need here with this, this system, come to us. We've got better stuff. I can guarantee you the system would change much faster here. But the problem right now is we are not competing on the right things. We're barely competing in healthcare. So it's kind of a weird thing that we call it like a market version of healthcare. Um, and this is not to say that just a glib free market approach to healthcare thing is any kind of um, obvious answer either. But definitely the market mechanism which allows to uh, create some competition is not, does not exist in healthcare right now. And we don't have a competition on the right things. And if you recall when Elizabeth Tysburg was talking about what, is, wh what should we be having competition on? On outcomes. And so if the money, in the end, follow the money, it will really get you to the right place. And so if we had systems where people were competing with each other to produce better care and were seeking out new tools and apps that ended up giving outcomes and everybody was competing on outcomes, like what happens? Like with food, you compete on outcomes. When you have a restaurant, you keep competing on outcomes. You go to a restaurant, you taste it, you experience it, and you go, oh, that sucks, and I'm going to go to the next one. And you so write restaurants on Yelp get better. that it sucked. Yeah. And, yeah. So, so those elements are, are, are really key. And we just don't, right now, we just don't have that in, in healthcare. It's changing a little bit, but slowly. But again, as we were talking before your, um, your lecture, 
that even with things like we've been for a long time, we keep waiting for pharma trials, for um, academia trials to do better at telling the people that participate in trials what happened. They, they just don't, ch you, you, you participate in a trial, someone's getting a drug up, you do, they don't even send newsletters out. What, what happened to that trial? But on the other hand, if the people funding, like the NIH funds a lot of them, if the NIH, here's, here's a call out to the NIH to just say, when you give a grant to run a trial, just make it a requirement that everybody who participates in a trial gives of their blood, sweat, and tears, gets an update at this, you know, at these time points, and then you have to show that you've done that, and if you have, you can apply for the next grant. But you can never get a second grant if you haven't told the very people that have, you know, who've, who've been getting poked and prodded, et cetera, the decency of just telling them, what happened? Did the trial work? Did it not work? Did you not recruit enough people or not? So it, that too, if you incented them, they would, it would work. All the people that today believe they can't, they don't know how to do it, or they right. can't, right. like this, they would they change. Would figure out a system. Right. Yeah. So that's some of the challenges we've been discussing in, in, in this course, is some of the systemic challenges as well. But as you can see, it, it filters right down to what you take for granted. And today, our expectations of our healthcare system are abysmally low, which is why it's interesting to me that many of you think that we're, we're far enough. We're, we're way behind other industries. Um, and definitely need to be demanding more uh, of the healthcare industry. And, and part of it's transparency too, right? So, you know, in the case of the app, if the app was open and showed, you know, 10% of the time it's not calling melanoma right, it would improve because crowdsourcing helps improve. What we have mm -hmm. in the current healthcare system is the dermatologist could be not calling melanoma right 50% of the time, and I don't know that because there's no scorecard. And they wear a white coat. And they sound, you know, you say doctor, and, yep. and when you start, as the results are coming out now, and people are looking at this data, you're really unearthing a lot of uh, misdiagnoses, a lot of mistakes the system makes. But we we get blind to it when we feel like there's, you know, the person in the white coat and they're saying something that's that's very expert. Yeah, and and I'm by the way not at all saying we don't need people. I actually think that we, in fact, just had this kind of d debate around high touch and high tech. I think we need both of them, and I think we need to enable a good person with the right technologies, like we do in other industries. Um, and we, we're going to still need really quality, quality clinicians. Because healthcare is always going to be one-on-one -on -one people stuff, where you need to be heard, you need to be seen by the person that you're going to trust to take care of you. Um, but I think giving them tools, and also dashboarding, so that I can see, you know, how is this clinic doing around my obesity and treating obesity, versus another clinic, then I would start to feel like I have something to say about what I'm picking, um, like I do with other things in my life. All right, so we're getting to the end of our time. If there's one thing I hope you've taken from this session, it's that you should never say that you can't do something. Since Sharon got up one morning and said, I'm going to discover the gene behind the disease that my kids have, and I'm not trained as a biologist, I'm a minister to start with, my husband hasn't done this before, but that's what I'm going to do, and she did. And she discovered the gene uh, and moved on to do even bigger and, and, and better things. So that's at the very minimum. But, but I hope that you also take some of these perspectives to heart on what it actually means to, to listen and hear something I myself am continuing to learn about. Um, so thank you, Sharon. You're welcome. And then next week, it's, Sh it's um, Stacy and myself to wrap up. Um, you guys are at exam week or something. I see a lot of sleepiness. Sleep came up. Without sharing too much confidence, as sleep did come up in my need conversation <laughs> with my partner. Sure, that's <laughs> so great hope, I, I hope you get a lot more sleep for next time, and we'll end next week. Cheers. Great. Thank you.